hello and welcome viewers to another podcast of Christian Living Australia. My name is Abel, this is my wife Magrita. We bring another podcast for you today. This time it's uh, X9 part one. It's going to be two parts. Um, the, we show you all the historical facts and the archaeological discoveries that's been made recently to uh, give you an enlightened view of the findings and events in, in the chapter. Let's pray together the blessing of God over the podcast of Acts 9. Heavenly Father, as we read through this thrilling episode in the pre-salvation life of Paul, it is awesome to realize that he would be your chosen vessel to bring the good news of the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. We thank you for arresting this man on the road to Damascus and commissioning him to preach the word of life. Thank you for his epistles and the many truths that they contain. They help us to live as you would have us to live and use us as a vessel to share the gospel of Christ with whomsoever you will. May we, like Paul, be bold to share this good news of salvation with others knowing that the time is short and that soon and very soon we will be taken to be with you in heaven. Thank you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading for today for Acts 9 is from the English Standard Version. I'm starting with verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to, to Jerusalem. Verse 3 Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Verse 6. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, sharing the voice but seeing no one. Verse 8. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. 9. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a di disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The uh, devout young Jew, the name of Saul, has discovered that uh, when he persecuted the, uh, Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they all fled. And what happened was they spread the message of the gospel as far as they go. Now, this has reached throughout the whole Judea and Samaria and as far as the north as Damascus. Uh, you can read about that in uh, Acts 8 verse 1 to 3. What you thought would be actually a simple, easy task to do is to destroy the young church. It's actually escalated and grown a more complicated case. Now, he requests the authorization from the high priests to arrest all those Jesus followers, wherever they may be. And as the Sanhedrin, um, as, as, as so the religious jurisdiction of all who follow the Judaism. A bit of a, a topographical statistics I want to give you about uh, Damascus. Uh, Damascus is a, a quite large city. It's about um, 133 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, and it was quite a significant city with good roads, which led up to the north to Syrian Ant uh, Antioch, to, uh, in the east to Arabia and Babylon, 
and self to Decapolis and Judea. And it was also importantly a port where the desert tribes came to trade. Now, at this time um, of Saul, it's unclear if it is controlled by Nabataya, which is the kingdom that's east of the Jordan River and Syria, and or if it was uh, semi-independent. Now, either way, it has ties to Nabataya, and um, Herod Antipas, when he divorced the king's daughter to marry his sister-in-law, he insulted the king of Nabataya. And um, even uh, John the Baptist comes into the picture here, and he spoke about the um, Antipas's marriage. And Antipas and Herodias killed him for that. The story, if you can remember what happened there, is that um, the, the king's daughter was, um, yeah, asked, um, the king said that she can have one wish, and she asked if she can have the head of the Baptist, the preacher, on a, on a platter. And the king obeyed her wish and um, get uh, John the Baptist killed that way. Uh, it's also thought that uh, John's disciples may have fled out of fear uh, for their lives to the safety of Nabataya. Um, they don't want to end up like John. And they started to prime the population there for, for the message of Jesus. Let's continue. When the Hasmoneans, now the Hasmoneans, uh, a quick explanation, he was a um, death dynasty of Jewish kings that fought to liberate the Judea from this Seleucid rule and to create an independent state. That was their task. Now, when these Asbonians won the Jewish independence in 142 BC, for those who don't know, BC means before Christ, the Romans ordered their neighboring states to extradite any Jew in the territory whom the Jewish government demanded now in 47 BC, when uh, Israel was under the, rule, the Roman rule, Julius Caesar affirmed this policy. He made it act uh, sort of um, authenticated and, and, and definite that this policy is alive and should be, should be obeyed. Uh, at this time, the Sanhedrin had the authority to send representatives to bring back uh, the Julian fugitives or immigrants to other Roman territories who broke, who um, have broken the Jewish law, so they had been taken captive and, and taken back. Now, no matter who controlled Damascus, because they were not sure wh who was in control of Damascus at the time, they must extradite the Jews who had fled the persecution in Jerusalem. Now, uh, on the road to Damascus, there was a, a, a zealous young Pharisee with the name of Saul. Saul uh, has received his orders uh, from the Jewish council, um, and that is to go and find every single Jewish Jesus follower that he can find, and he have to bring them back to Jerusalem so they could be tried for the crime of blasphemy. So that is a, quite a serious um, a problem for the Jews. Now, uh, legally at this time, as the Sanhedrin uh, cannot just execute uh, apostate Jews. Now, apostate, the meaning of apostate is um, Jews that um, follow Jesus. They um, um, set aside their law, Jewish laws and they, they're looking for Jesus. Uh, now, these guys could not be executed for, according to the Sanhedrin's law. But it appears that the Romans, when the case uh, is just right, the situation is uh, lean to it, the Romans just look the other way and they just go ahead and do it anyway. The next part I'm going to explain to you is... Uh, the pinnacle of chapter 9, which is the 
the biggest event, and that's where Saul met Jesus. On his way to Damascus to arrest uh, Jesus' followers, Saul has been thrown to the ground. He's surrounded by a, a great light and could hear the insistent voice uh, claiming to be that of Jesus. This is demanding to know why Saul is persecuting him. Uh, Saul's traveling companions could, and could hear a noise, but they cannot see the speaker. They couldn't see the person who's, who's talking at, to, to Saul. Now, Saul, however, hears that Jesus is speaking very clearly. That Paul, his eyes was open, but he couldn't see, so he was already blind made blind by Jesus at a time when Jesus was talking to him. Now, first thing what happens to Saul after this event is he had to go to the city because of his blindness. He couldn't walk, so his companions took him by the hand and they led him to the city. And the specific place in the city was called Straight Street. According to uh, archaeological findings and history, that Straight Street is still existing today. It, um, and uh, then um, Joel had to wait there for a messenger from Jesus. So um, by this time now, when Jesus is finished with Saul, um, from the, the past this, this discussions we had, I had with you, is we know that Paul is blind. We know that Paul has been taken to Straight Street by a companion uh, in Damascus where he uh, has to wait and uh, what happened there was Paul uh, was blind all the time and he fasted for three days. Now the messenger that was sent by Jesus was also a disciple and his name was Ananias. Now he was sent by Jesus on, or, or was sent Jesus on God's command to go and talk to, uh, to Saul. Uh, but the thing is, is that Saul uh, becomes the very thing that he'd hated just days before this event of Saul. And that was that Saul was the believer that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. It's very interesting how much uh, Saul's experience parallels with Cornelius's uh, written about in Acts 10. In both these cases, God prepares the two men and tells them what to do. Uh, see Acts 10 verse 1 to 8 then um, God prepares his evangelists Ananias and Peter both Ananias and Peter are actually reluctant to go ahead and God reassures them of his plan for them their obedience results in two major steps in the spreading of the gospel firstly uh, Cornelius' conversion Convinces Peter, however, and the other and the other apostles also gain confidence and trust that uh, Gentiles can be followed can follow Christ, which is the uh, first time that it happens. However, Saul's conversion it prepares him to be the primary evangelist to the Gentiles. <laughs> Let's continue our reading um, from verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Number 12. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his strength. 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. 14. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. 16. For 
I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me, so that you may regain your sight, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. 19. And take food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. God contacts Ananias in a vision, meaning a prophetic experience while he's awake. This is different from dreams, which happens when a person is sleeping. Several people in the New Testament had visions, but since the compilation of the New Testament, they have become much rarer. Today, it seems, God sends visions to those who are looking for him but do not have access to the Bible. This has been mentioned in some Muslim testimonies of their conversion to Christianity. And if I can just think of one woman, as Bilda Sheik, um, I will definitely recommend you read her book about Dare to Call Him Father. She also received dreams, visions, and even um, experienced Jesus in her garden. The Roman government gave the Jewish leaders was that they had religious justification over every single Jew, does not matter where they live. I mean, Damascus is 133, mile, 133 miles from Jerusalem, so Saul had the authority, and Ananias knows it. In addition, Saul is from Tarsus. Tarsus is one of the many cities outside Italy where those born there received Roman citizenship. Saul is doubtlessly protected. Even while still identified as Judaism, following Saul, the man who will still be best known as the Jesus follower Paul later, already at that point of time, had a habit of praying. Prayer will be a significant part of Paul's ministry, and he will write to the churches about its importance. You can go and read that in Romans 12 verse 12, Ephesians 6 verse 18, Philippians 4 verse 6, Colossians 4 verse 2, and 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Even now, after Jesus tells Saul to wait until he is told what to do, Saul communes with God and readies his heart for God's message. He knows that prayer isn't just for requests. Any time we communicate with someone, we understand them better and hopefully grow closer to them. Saul is at a very confusing point at that point of time in his life and he needs to stay grounded. Jesus has now asked Ananias to meet with Saul and finish his conversion from prosecutor to apostle. Ananias is definitely not convinced he describes Saul as binding the Jesus followers in Jerusalem. Ananias would have heard from refugees and know it was much, much worse. By his own admission, Saul beat them, voted for their execution, chased them in a raging fury and tried to make them blaspheme Jesus. And that could only have been accomplished by torture. As much as Ananias trusts Jesus, he's not sure what can be done against such a reckless hate. At this point in history of the church, Saul of Tarsus is the last person Ananias or any other Christian would want to meet. Jesus reveals why he wants Ananias to go. He had commissioned the apostles to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria. And to the ends of the earth, Saul will help with the ends of the earth part. And that ends of the earth part is all the Gentiles. Saul's primary mission will be the Gentiles. But he will typically start by reaching out to the Jews. Luke will record three of his extensive missionary journeys. 
At each new city, Saul, then going by the Greek version of his name, Paul, goes to the synagogues, or if there are not enough Jews for a synagogue, the place where Jews gathered to pray. There he will explain how Jesus of Nazareth perfectly matches what is written in the Hebrew Scriptures about the Messiah. Some Jews and Gentiles who worship the Jewish God will believe, others won't. And Saul was regularly kicked out of the synagogues. So I will speak with several leaders as well. This first step of this first missionary trip is to the island of Cyprus, where he will speak with the proconsul Sergius Paulus. After Saul is arrested in Jerusalem, he will willingly tell his story to the governor Felix. When Felix is replaced by Festus, Saul seems to lose his patience. And that we can later read in Acts 24 and in Acts 25. But when Festus entertains Herod Agrippa in Acts 26, Saul will happily see Jesus with the king. Saul, who will later adopt the Greek version of the name Paul, describes his suffering in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 23 to 29. He will be imprisoned beaten, lashed, stoned, and even shipwrecked three separate times. Eventually, the church traditions say he will be martyred. But he puts it into perspective, writing to a different church. Now I rejoice in my suffering for you, the church, in Colossia, sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in the church affliction for the sake of Jesus' body. That is the church. Colossians 1 verse 24 Jesus' suffering and sacrifice provide the way of salvation. Paul will ensure the offer of salvation reaches the people. After a period of physical blindness, Jesus removed the scales from Saul's eyes and his heart. Saul knows his sinful character, calling himself the least of the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9 and Ephesians 3 verse 8. But by the grace of Jesus Christ, he is redeemed. In Romans 7 verse 24 verse 25. Now, he is called to bring spiritual sight to the Gentiles. It is customary at the time for a new convert to be baptized immediately. Later, Shaw would testify that Ananias also told him his mission to be witness to what is happening to him. Later in Acts 22, at another time, Saul says that Jesus gave him the mission to preach, particularly to the Gentiles, in Acts 26. That Ananias reaffirmed Jesus' message would provide great validation for both of them. Paul can see again. Now he is very hungry. In the culture, to eat with someone is to affirm a fealty with them. When Saul accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he was reconciled to God. His sins are forgiven. He has no more requirement to fulfill the Mosaic law. But he is also reconciled with other Jesus followers, and he is on a mission to make more. Well, we was, uh, this is the end of part one of uh, Acts 9. I certainly hope that you've uh, found it interesting and enjoyed it. And um, thank you for watching our podcast. Looking forward to uh, meet you again in part two. Shalom. Hi, hey, hey, before you go, before you go, if you haven't subscribed yet, please click the subscribe button, uh, share and like the videos. Let's spread this good news to as many people as we can. Bye.